Welcome to the 31st Annual Kenneth Aller Smith Symposium, presented by the USC Center for Public Relations. Our annual discussion of the PR profession was founded in 1990 to honor Dr. Kenneth Aller Smith. He joined USC Annenberg in 1970 and was one of the first public relations instructors in the country. Dr. Smith created USC's international curricula in journalism broadcasting, public relations, and advertising, started the master's degree program in public relations in 1976, and founded the nation's first degreed sports information program. He was a national president of PRSA and helped start the Public Relations Student Society of America. Dr. Smith was loved by his students, who established this event that Trojan alums simply know as KOS. It's an evening for leaders in the field to share their insights on the PR profession. These annual events, in ordinary times, provide a unique opportunity for graduating Trojans to meet in person and network with Southern California PR professionals. We look forward to hosting KOS 2022 live on campus next March 31st. Tonight's theme is Politics, Polarization, and Purpose. Please welcome your event host and moderator, USC professor and the director of the Center for Public Relations, Fred Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 31st annual Kenneth Aller Smith Symposium. The second one on Zoom, we're live from the USC campus, and I hope this is the last one we do on Zoom. Next time, I want to see everybody here at the Annenberg School. But thanks uh, for all of you who joined us. Uh, despite the pandemic, we have a record number of attendees for what I believe will be a really interesting evening. As Ron said, the topic tonight is politics, polarization, and purpose. It's a little like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickle peppers. Uh, last year, we focused our research on the growth and influence of new activism and its impact on communications. This, that turned out to be a very timely topic. This year, we continued in that vein by exploring politi how politics divides our nation and how polarization impacts all of the issues we care about and our work. To better understand this problem, we surveyed 1,000 PR people, 550 journalists, and about 1,000 average Americans. I'm not gonna walk through the results of our study, but you can view our, download our beautiful report on our website, or if you send me an email, I'll send you a hard copy. But I do wanna summarize a little bit about it. The main point is we ask people will, now that there's been a change in the administration in Washington, will polarization increase, stay the same, or decrease? And all three groups said it would stay the same or increase in overwhelming numbers the citizens, journalists, and PR professionals. When we dug deeper, we found out that the average American, rather than opening their mind to new ideas and empathizing with those of different opinions, are really going to double down on what they already believe in the future. The journalists forecasted that there would be a reduction in political coverage, which we may all welcome, and that would result in a drop in overall viewership of the news. But at the same time, they predicted a rise in fake news and in conspiracy theories. So it's sort of a two-sided coin there. And P PR people predicted that their companies and their clients will face increasing expectations from their employees, from their customers, and from activists. And they're gonna prepare for that by expanding their diversity and inclusion, by speaking out on specific issues and developing purpose-driven campaigns. Today, politics and PR are inextricably linked. At its worst, politics can incite a dangerous level of polarization among people who should have a common interest. At its best, PR can build constructive conversations with people of different opinions. And no one knows better than our keynote speaker, Robert Gibbs, who has experienced politics, polarization, and PR from every single angle. First as a communications director for the Obama presidential campaign, 
then as the White House press secretary, then as the lead of communications at one of the biggest companies in the world, McDonald's, and now as a commentator on MSNBC and a senior counselor at a leading political PR firm called Bully Pulpit. Robert is also a member of the USC Annenberg Board of Advisors, and I am really grateful that he is here tonight to share his front row perspective on polarization with all of us. Robert? Good evening, Fred, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm gonna go ahead. Good evening to everyone at USC and in Los Angeles, and hello to everyone watching this over Zoom, just as we have lived our lives uh, over the past 12 months. Like Fred, I can hardly wait to continue this important get together again in person next year in Los Angeles, particularly because it feels like it's 26 degrees outside here in Chicago. First, let me begin by saying what an honor it is to get to speak with you tonight and be asked to deliver this keynote at the Kenneth Aller Smith Symposium for Public Relations. Whenever I've attended this event or the discussion ever turns to Dr. Smith, I hear described the very type of caring, thoughtful, and knowledgeable instructor you'd wish to have in learning a profession like ours. He set a high bar, but one I know Annenberg at USC is prepared to meet. And I suppose I should thank Fred for asking me to do this. Fred, thank you for giving me such an easy to solve topic with which to speak on tonight. In all seriousness, thank you for the honor. Now I should warn you up front that this is going to be a good news, bad news speech. And since I'm a bad news first kind of person, let's start aptly with political polarization. I would love to come before you tonight to faithfully and optimistically report to you that it's not as bad as you think. But unfortunately, it's every bit as bad as you think. And the outlook I fear is it may get worse before it gets better. The truth is the polarization of our politics is deep. It is systemic. It is exacerbated by almost all of our digital platforms and partly the cause of a perilous drop in the trust in some of the most venerable and revered institutions in our society. Over the last year, it has infected and distorted our national views towards science almost as pervasively as the virus has infected our country and disrupted our lives. And who can forget the haunting images of a capital overrun by rioters seeking to disrupt the very essence of our great democracy. Now, it would be easy to tell you this is all the result of the whirlwind of the last four years. But this time of crisis extends far longer than the term or personality of just one president. This problem has been with us for a while. Let's look at the makeup of Congress, particularly the House of Repre Representatives, where fewer and fewer races are even competitive and districts are dominated by margins far in excess of the close elections we tend to see nationally. In 1992, there were 103 members of the House elected from what 538.com called swing districts, those in which the margin in the presidential race was within five percentage points of the national result. By 2012, that number dwindled to just 35 such congressional districts, or barely a third of the total 20 years ago. Instead, the number of landslide congressional districts, those in which the presidential vote margin deviated by at least 20 percentage points from the national result, roughly doubled. In 1992, there were 123 such districts, 65 of them strongly Democratic and 58 strongly Republican. In 2012, there were 242 of them, 117 favored Democrats and 125 Republicans. In 2014, more than 80% of the House races were decided by at least 15 percentage points, including roughly one in six races that were not contested by one of the two major political parties. Of the 435 seats up for election in 2016, 
Just 25 were considered pure toss-up races by the gold standard Cook Political Report. In 2020's election, that number was just 26. I don't have to describe the impact of this on our government. Members of the House are more likely in this environment to lose a primary within their party than be beaten by someone from another party in their district. The disincentive to seek compromise or bipartisanship abounds. But it's more dire than that, honestly. While some level of political gerrymandering might explain changes in the voting in House districts, the story at a national level is just as disconcerting. 2020 saw a number of records in voting patterns at a national level around polarization. There have now been nine presidential races in a row without either party experiencing a national landslide, meaning the national popular vote margin was at least 10%. The previous record set during Another period of deep polarization from 1876 to 1900 was seven presidential elections. We've also now had seven presidential elections in a row where fewer than a quarter of the states changed parties. The previous record was just three presidential elections. And in 11 of the last 15 elections, presidential and midterm, at, le at least one of either the House, the Senate, or White House has changed party hands. Again, the last time we saw so much volatil volatility was from 1876 to 1896, when at least one institution changed partisan hands in eight out of 10 elections. The results of the 2020 election themselves could hardly have been closer. The split is in the Senate is equally divided at 50-50. The House is separated by just a few votes, and had 43,000 votes been cast differently out of 155 and a half million from November, the presidential election would have turned out differently. So even while government is controlled by just one party, it's by the narrowest of margins. Ticket splitting is down. Fewer can get congressional districts elect one party to Congress and a different one to the White House. I could go on and on, but I think you see the picture I'm painting. Now you might ask, is there an end in sight to all of this? Can history teach us any lessons or give us any hope for the future? Regrettably, it doesn't look good. The period most analogous to this is the period I just talked about after reconstruction and during the Gilded Age, the two decades from 1876 to 1896. And while our length of polarization might suggest a realignment could be coming, nothing appears on the horizon as it did as we approach the turn of the 20th century. In fact, we are more likely than ever to have one party win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College. It's happened four times in our nation's history. Twice it's happened in just the last six presidential elections. I wish I could give you better hope on this front, but with a straight face, I simply can't. And real reforms seem hard to contemplate in such a polarized Congress. Once the census is finished, redistricting will start and fewer and fewer congressional races will be competitive. The cycle only repeats itself. All of this is what prompted political science, scientist and New America fellow Lee Drutman to write, rather than being one two-party nation, we are becoming two one-party nations. It's simply hard to argue with that. Now, I promised you this would have some good news in it, so let's get to that. While I think there is lots of credible evidence of polarization in our political system, in our voting and in the makeup of our government at so many levels, I'm actually optimistic that there is a distinct majority of voters out there that actually agree, agree on some of the most important issues we face as a society. To that end, this was the headline in Axios recently, quote, Americans agree about more issues than they realize, end quote. The story goes on to describe a poll that asks voters what they want versus their perception of what issues they believe the rest of society prioritizes, and found, maybe surprisingly, a lot of similarity. 
For instance, climate change ranked in the top five personal priorities for the future of the United States, even though respondents believe it ranked closer to the bottom for most others. Nine issues showed up in the top 15 priorities of both parties' voters. And both Biden and Trump voters expressed a sense of urgency in addressing five of them. Access to high quality health care, safety in communities, criminal justice reform, help for the middle class, and a modernized infrastructure. The pollster asked to summarize the findings in the story said, quote, it's an intensity of differences on a, in a, on a small number of things that is bleeding out into this perception of we just don't agree on anything, end quote. Now I've spent, I spent the better part of my time starting in 2007 and 2008, and then again for more than two years in the White House working on expanded access to healthcare. And I still have some of the scars to prove it. And yes, there are certainly policy differences, but the starting point in the debate isn't one of polarization, but instead one of agreement. How absolutely refreshing. So despite all the discussion of rampant polarization, Americans share similar priorities for the country. And folks, that's a great place to start. Let's take a look at a few issues in depth, in depth around this, and we'll start with the minimum wage. Here are some realities. This pandemic has shown us that all too often the workers we pay the least are the ones we consider some of the most essential. Congress last voted to raise the minimum wage in 2007, and, the, and that increase went into effect in 2009, raising the federal minimum wage to $7.25 an hour. And that's exactly where the federal minimum wage has sat ever since, for more than a decade. Recent attempts to add a minimum wage increase to COVID relief, considered and ultimately passed by Congress a few weeks ago, were stymied by a parliamentary ruling. But, but let's ask, how do most Americans actually feel about raising the minimum wage? A poll released by Morning Consult only three weeks ago showed 60% of Americans wanted an increase, while just 32% opposed increasing the minimum wage. Just 32%. Maybe that's why if you go outside Washington, you'll find that 29 states have a minimum wage higher than the federal one. And those increases have happened in some very interesting places. In 2014, Arkansas passed a ballot initiative to raise its minimum wage with 65% of the voters voting yes. What else happened in Arkansas in, 20, in the 2014 election? They elected a Republican governor and Republicans gained complete control of state government for the first time since reconstruction. Additionally, voters elected a Republican US Senator and sent a two-term Democrat back home. That's right, in one of the most conservative electorates, the vote wasn't close. But the Arkansas story doesn't end there. In 2018, voters in Arkansas again raised the minimum wage at the ballot box. This time, more than 68% voted for the increase. Oh, and Arkansas reelected their Republican governor with more than 65% of the vote. He won all but eight counties in an election where the Republican margin of victory was the largest it has been in Arkansas history. If I haven't persuaded you yet on the minimum wage, I've got one more point of reference. In 2020, 61% of Floridians voted to raise the minimum wage to $15, all while Trump won the state convincingly with 51% of the vote. Maybe the Brookings Institute, a noted Washington DC think tank summed it up best in their headline after the election, quote, even a divided America agrees on raising the minimum wage, end quote. But you see, it doesn't stop there. Even on issues we're absolutely supposed to be polarized on, there's a remarkable amount of actual agreement. Let's take guns. It seems like every few weeks we hear about another terrible and tragic mass shooting. Sometimes it's been, as it has been lately, those stories seem to be heard every few days. And despite the increase in shootings, it's been almost three decades since Congress enacted measures to ban assault weapons or institute a waiting period on handgun purchases. And if you listen to the debates in Washington, it's hard to be optimistic. Frankly, it's normal to be downright cynical. 
except for one big thing. Right now, 84% of Americans support a universal background check on all gun purchases. The percentage that opposes that idea is just 11%. Let me repeat that, just 11%. Immigration is very much in the news these days. And frankly, it's probably the issue with the most intensity and the most polarization. But despite all of that, when asked at the beginning of February, 69% supported an earned pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who can pass a background check and pay taxes. That includes 51% of Republicans. Fully 72% supported passing the DREAM Act, giving those who are brought to America as children the ability to earn citizenship, including 55% of Republicans. Just 24% of Americans opposed each idea. For a little more than two decades, partly as a result of an extraordinarily close presidential election in 2000, we have lived with the pervasive idea that we're an almost evenly divided country, a 50-50 nation. And as I've talked about before, we've seen extensive polarization in our political elections. We are dealing even today with the closest margins in Washington. But all the while, Americans had more in common than we were ever led to believe, exacerbated because gerrymandering and deeply partisan voting habits have kept many of our elections close. But under the surface, there's a different story altogether. We've seen some remarkable attitudinal change during this time of intense hyperpolarization. Marijuana legalization is now supported by 68% of Americans, up from just 44%. Today, 76% perceive racial discrimination as a major problem, up from just 51%. But in my opinion, no issue has seen a bigger change than our attitudes toward gays and lesbians, and particularly the issue of gay marriage. In 2004, and partly in response to what was happening with gay marriage in Massachusetts and San Francisco, no fewer than 11 states, Arkansas, Georgia, Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, Montana, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Ohio, Oregon, and Utah, all explicitly banned gay marriage at the ballot box that November. More than 20 million voted on these initiatives and cumulatively, they passed by a two to one margin. The lowest percentage of any state that night to ban gay marriage was 57% in Oregon. Supporters of the ban felt momentum and talked next of an amendment to the US Constitution. So what happened? Well, as we know, over the course of a little more than a decade, the issue became settled law. In 2015, the Supreme Court made gay marriage legal in the United States. Now that of course didn't just happen overnight or without the concerted efforts of an awful lot of people and a focused campaign to bring about real change. Through a long push by everyone from impassioned activists and everyday family members alike, that perceived 2004 momentum was challenged head on. And while no single thing changed perceptions, I wanna call out one catalyst for change that gave this issue an important push forward and use it to challenge all of us going forward tonight. And that was the involvement of corporate America. In 2011, four years before the Supreme Court would make its landmark ruling, 70 businesses and professional organizations signed a brief asking the U.S. Court of Appeals in Massachusetts to overturn the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act, barring the federal government from recognizing gay marriages. By the time the legal fight around the 2004 Ohio ban made it to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2015, 379 companies signaled their support for marriage equality. And to be fair, long before that brief was ever authored, companies throughout America offered healthcare and benefit benefits to same-sex couples. 
Today, the once dominant political issue of gay marriage has vanished from our debates. Though the fight for equal rights in the LGBT, LGBTQ community clearly remains. While many of our news diets include pretty obsessive coverage of our national politics and the goings on of Congress, their inner workings simply are not what actually impacts how most of us live our daily lives. Far more of us are attuned to how our employers view the world and how that impacts our daily lives. And for corporate America, issues like equal rights, climate change, immigration reform, and others have mostly been agreed upon. Even ideas like Black Lives Matter, opposed by more than who supported it just four years ago, is now universally echoed by businesses across America. A colleague of mine, Danny Franklin at BPI, and someone who spent decades in survey research calls this transformation of public opinion on important economic, cultural, and social issues, the new modern mainstream. When corporate America orients itself, it doesn't do so based on our fraught and polarized politics or even the beliefs of the middle of the country. It aims squarely for the middle of the mainstream, this new modern mainstream. It's the very reason so many companies acknowledged those same-sex couples long before the Supreme Court ever did. So where does this all leave us today? Many companies felt external pressure from stakeholders and activists to get more involved just four years ago on issues such as climate change, when progress on what, on, on what looked to be coming to a standstill. Thousands put their business operations through the rigor of creating a verifiable science-based greenhouse gas emissions reductions target. Last summer, activists were joined by the call of employees in reaction to the horrific murder of George Floyd to create a groundswell that pushed corporate America to embrace the quest for greater diversity and equal opportunity, and to tackle more loudly the specter of racial discrimination. And all of this has been surrounded by the ever-increasing cadence of investors pushing for a greater leap into environmental, social, and governance issues through ESG evaluations. In researching topics for this speech, I came across readings about the historical legal threshold for setting up a corporation. Today, a division usually within each state's Secretary of State's office grants through the filing of some rather simple paperwork, the designation of an entity to be a corporation. But long ago, it was a bigger political body that granted the charter of a corporation and then did so only after the corporation declared their public good and the benefits this new corporation would bring to society. Think about that. In the beginning, the idea of CSR or corporate social responsibility was in fact a redundant phrase. It wasn't simply something enlightened brands did. Enunciating the stated and specific public good is a practice we should strive for once again. Our challenge must be to take the ideas involved in so-called stakeholder capitalism and make it actually mean something more than a phrase used every few years in a paid campaign's newspaper ad or spoken of on an investor day to answer or rebuff a potential critic. Our intractable politics have brought this have brought this on and now companies which have an enormous place in our society and, our, and in our lives must act. These challenges aren't going away. Activists outside our headquarters and employees within them will continue to demand a heightened sense of purpose and better yet, a record of real action and measurable change. This cycle will only accelerate and demand even more. As the saying goes, to whom much is given, much too is expected. Just look at the events in Georgia over the last week. Legislative action to restrict voting rights have now caused Delta and Coke to speak out in ways they hadn't before the laws passed. There is no going back. So lastly, what does this mean for us as communicators? To me, communicators have always been at the cross-section 
of all of these currents. And I think our voices, our insight, and our skills are needed as never before. We have been called storytellers, reputation managers, impact officers, the conscience of our companies. Today, we must become impassioned internal activists for change. Now, I know often activism is seen skeptically inside business. It conjures up image, images of protesters in the parking lot with signs and loudspeakers, or those who seek new strategic plans or leadership, leadership changes with boardroom takeovers. But it doesn't have to be scary or anxiety inducing, at least not with our steady leadership. For us, it must mean the wisdom to lead in an increasingly volatile world that will demand a greater voice, a greater role, and deeper change for and from corporations. We must faithfully guide businesses and institutions to embrace this vibrant mainstream of our people and bring about greater equity and equality. We must challenge our colleagues to do more and to embrace the evolving world around us. We must declare the public good and chart the path forward to a better way and a better place. For me, I think those of us tasked with helping the public better understand our actions are uniquely positioned right now to explain the actions the public most expects our institutions to take. It is, after all, what we are here to do. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. That was a fascinating uh, look at polarization from the national level and a political front. Um, just on a, on a, from a personal basis, sure. Um, there was polarization during the Obama administration, for sure. There was divisiveness, but does it feel different to you now than it did then, or or is it is it the same? Well, I I think in many ways um, we saw a heightened level of it uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration, and uh, I think that continued to grow and rise throughout 2009 and 2010 and even through the remainder of President Obama's term. I think that polarization got even higher uh, throughout the four years, clearly, uh, of the Trump administration. And I think what the current administration has inherited is that deeply hyper-polarized environment uh, that I just spoke about. And I think it, uh, they're, they're trying desperately and to their best ability uh, to navigate a world that, that I just described in which those debates are had in Congress and those boxes are, are held on cable TV with opposing views when I think so many or, or many, many more people in the real world actually agree on a lot of what's going on. You talk about business being a factor and, and government. You're also part of the media, a commentator on, on cable news. How, how do you think that media has contributed to the polarization that we're experiencing right now? Yeah, it's a great question, Fred. I think all too often, um, all too often, and I think this is, this is partly the economics of, of news gathering these days. I think it, it's, um, it's partly our um, our divergent attention spans uh, these days for news. Uh, but I think all too often stories are boiled down to black or white, yes or no, Democrat or Republican, red or blue. And I think all too often in our society, we're forced to pick one side or the other. And I think all too often the American people don't readily make that forced choice. They don't live in that world. Uh, I'm struck by, um, you know, the news media does what I think I would probably do if I was a reporter. I would figure out what my story of the day was and find two views that were so completely divergent to help me explain what I was talking about. And uh, I just don't think most people occupy that deep divergence in a way in which so much of our politics portends every day. 
We have several questions from people in the audience. One was, you mentioned what's happening in Georgia with Delta and Coca-Cola. Um, this is sort of something new. Where do you think this is headed? What do you think, what actions are gonna be taken by these companies in order to yeah. see a change in this, in this situation? Well, I think it'll be fascinating to watch both of these two companies, obviously enormously revered inside of Georgia. My question is, is what, quite frankly, can they do about a law that's already been passed? Yeah. And I'm not entirely optimistic that they can do much, though I do think you will see the beginnings of, of something that approximates a, an economic boycott like you saw that Indiana faced uh, in, I think, 2011 or 2012 around religious freedom and North Carolina faced uh, around uh, transgender rights. But I do think it is going to force, as this debate happens throughout the country, for more and more companies to have to get involved and speak out earlier. You know, what, what got Delta into so much trouble was um, they put out a message internally that, that made it seem like the bill was better and that they had changed it for the good. And I can only imagine that it was probably hard for the leadership to even walk in the virtual halls of, of, of that company over Zoom and look at people in the eye and really communicate that. So what I believe that's going to do, whether it's voting rights or wage issues or worker conditions or immigration or any of these things, I think companies are going to be forced to be more activist more quickly. Uh, I don't think they're going to have the option of walking off or leaving the playing field because, quite frankly, because of that intractability, we've looked to business to make progress. And in many ways, they have on things like climate change, on thing like, things like wages, um, on things like uh, equal rights. They, they've helped lead the way. And quite frankly, they've made and democratized those views such that we can see those changes in public opinion. Because there's, there's Congress and those opinions are fairly hardened. But it's really, quite frankly, the rest of America that is looking for the types of leadership and leaders to draw us toward where a majority of us already are. Another question from the audience is sort of like, on a national level, what, what can be done to stop polarization? And, and Biden in particular, he's calling for national unity. Yeah. If you were advising him, how would you, what would you say to him to, to make this message be more well received, I guess? Well, look, I, I think, in some ways, uh, you know, he has both, he, well, he has obviously, COVID is an enormous curse, but I think he has the ability with his leadership around the pandemic to break through a lot of the polarization that we saw over the past year. I mean, who would have thought in the middle of um, a, a worldwide virus that um, taking public health steps like wearing a mask would somehow become such a polarizing political issue. Yeah. And so I think if he leads us around economic issues and, and around the pandemic issues and the vaccine rollout, I think if he can make progress on things like that, that gives people, uh, I think, a renewed faith in the ability of, of government and the ability of the president to lead. Now, during the 2012 election um, or campaign, you know, my candidate, President Obama, said that if he was reelected, the fever would break and, and you, you'd have this sort of era of compromise and bipartisanship come. He was reelected and that, that era never came. And, and I don't hold out, as I said in the beginning, huge hopes, Fred, that, that any one person can break this cycle that we're in. I don't think demography is going to, to bail us out. I don't know that any single issue is going to fundamentally change how we view the world. I, I think we're in for a much longer polarized slog inside of our government, even as we understand more and more the commonality of how we see solutions to important issues. Another question, uh, sort of related, it's it's core to what we're talking about, but it's the issue of 
diversity and inclusion as a business imperative and also as a, a government imperative. How do you see that tying into polarization? And, and do you think that the efforts being done are, are making a difference at this point? You talked about the Black Lives Matter protest yeah. this summer. Well, I mean, look, I, I mean, look, I think there's probably no hotter issue uh, than race in our country. And, and it's been that way for, uh, for decades. Uh, and so I think progress around those issues um, will take time. I, I think fundamentally, though, what happened to George Floyd changed the views and the outlooks of so many. Fred, I, I remember reading a poll around that time, and I forget the exact number, but the number of people, myself included, that, that really had to confront what happened on that street that day put us in a set of shoes and gave us a lens of an experience that, quite frankly, so many of us were insulated from. And, and that searing event began to tear that filter down. It made us look and confront. We had to watch that video. I think the efforts are enormously important. And I think if we can't if government, if institutions, if nonprofits, if businesses can't seize this moment, I'm not entirely sure when the next inflection point will come. I will, though, challenge everybody to think through, it's easy to change your social media avatar, right? It's easy to put something up on Instagram. It's harder to make real progress. And I, quite frankly, am looking forward as we get closer to the anniversary of some of these commitments to, to that I hope we'll have the patience to really dig in and figure out whether we're making a difference. And if we're not, to redouble those efforts. If we are making progress, we should also understand this is not going to be an endpoint. It's going to be a continual need for improvement. But I think the moment of whether or not it's working is still yet to be determined because I think it's up to us to make sure the promises that we made that seemed easy in light of what we saw, those now have to be measured. Those have to be reported on and, and we have to be transparent. All people need to be transparent about where they are on that journey. You. You talked in just a second ago about social media and how that is is a, fa a factor all, in all this. And one of the audience members wants to know whether you think social media is it, it, it is a tool, a productive tool for activist groups and for people to mobilize in certain situations. But it also seems to be somewhat polarizing tool yeah. with political parties. How do you view that the balance of the value of social media in this in this yeah. argument. And I would say to that questioner, it's, it's you, the great way you framed it is, is really perfect. I mean, there are the, the ability to create a group uh, of like-minded individuals seeking change and being able to put that change in front of powerful people exists in many ways because we have these platforms. While at the same time, um, they accelerate the type of polarization that, that we deal with every day. And so I don't know that they'll ever be perfect one way or the other. I, I think there'll be a, a, a bit of good and a bit of, of, of bad or challenge, just as, as many of the issues are. I tend to think they can be a net positive because of that ability to bring like-minded people together to show concerted, cohesive action. Um, but I'm mindful of just the accelerant that they can become. And, and I will say this, I think it is really important, I've talked about this for a, a while in, in speaking to groups, I think we have to try to get out of our own filter bubbles and our own boxes of belief. Um, you know, if you order a book on Amazon, Fred, the, the, the their algorithm will tell you, if you like this book, you'll like these books. Yeah. And, and I fear that for the last 15 or 20 years, our politics has become just like that algorithm, right? If you like this conservative 
uh, host, you'll like these conservative hosts and you'll like this conservative line, just if you, just as you might on the, on the left. And I, I think we've got to figure out ways to try to have real conversations of commonality and get out of just having these discussions with people that already believe what we believe or share all of the experiences that we've ever shared. If, if, if we don't do that, then it's really hard to live and understand the experience as best we can for something like what happened in Minneapolis last year. That's a really good point. Um, Robert, I wanna ask you one last question. Sure. Our survey asked people in the media whether post-Trump, the media would have more credibility or less. And they said that they thought they would have more, but it wasn't a giant number. The overwhelming number was related to the White House communications team. Mm -hmm. Would they have more cr credibility? And it was like the number was off the charts and the number of people thought that the, the White House uh, communications team would have more credibility than they have in the past. What is your thought about that transition between, between you've done this job. Sure. What's, what is it? What is going to happen, the transition between what was happening with Trump and now what we're seeing with Biden? Look, I, I've always thought and I, and I believed that when I took that job, I had a unique responsibility, not just to the White House, but to the country. And, and it, it's a unique position in that briefing room provides a unique role in that every day, whether it's good or convenient, um, a spokesperson for the president has to go in there and answer questions from the news media about what's happening in the world. I thought the fact that that didn't happen on a regular basis or infused with truth for four years was a real detriment, not just to the history of the White House, but to the application of our government and to the consent of the governed. Um, I, I can't imagine, or I should say this, I, I think the impact of poor communications over the past year in the pandemic is one of the leading causes of the distressing results that we've seen. And I, I'm, I have renewed hope. I know many of the people I, I consider Jen Psaki a, a, a friend, um, that that they're reinstituting the important role of, again, walking into that room and transparently answering questions, defending the White House and the president, but to both the press and the American people. It is an extraordinarily important role. It's one that has to function well in a democracy. It requires certain things from both sides of that engagement. But I'm, I'm thrilled, honestly, not just simply because of who's in that room giving that briefing. I'm quite frankly happy that that process is working again, that that muscle of our democracy is, is, is going away from being atrophied to being built again. And so that gives that gives me hope, even though I know uh, that it, it may not always be a cheery relationship between the the media uh, and the communications office. But it's interesting the the PR people that work in the White House are probably the highest profile communicators in the world in our profession. Do you think that they their behavior and the way they operate? reflects on this profession for the rest of us? I, I, it, absolutely. It, 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 um, and as you said, I think it, it, it may serve as an outsized model for, um, for how we're viewed. Um, I, I know, I, I knew, Fred, when I, when I briefed during certain points that, that I was answering questions and I was being not watched, not just by people in the United States or by people in the White House, but by people all over the world, it 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 sends a message. It 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 is, in many ways, 
the most personal ambassador that a, that a president has. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thrilled that it's working again. Um, I hope that whenever the White House changes parties, that a Republican comes in and, and institutes the same sort of communications apparatus and gives the same sort of question and answer periods infused with truthfulness that we have become accustomed to. I, I One of the first things I did before I walked into that briefing room was spend time with people like Marlon Fitzwater, who'd been the press secretary, not for just one president, but for two Republican presidents. And so it is a hefty job. It comes with a lot of responsibility, uh, and I'm happy that it's working again. We are too, and and I have to say that you did a great job in that very tough job. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for tonight. It was uh, it was really great to to hear from you, and thank you for always being there to support Annenberg and USC. We really appreciate your involvement. Fred, and thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. So uh, let's shift gears for just a second. Uh, Robert talked a little bit about the media and in our polarization research, working with Muckrack, we surveyed 550 journalists to find out how they felt about the current divide in our country. And their answers were almost identical to the PR professionals we talked to, uh, which was, was, was a nice surprise. Like us, they predicted that the change from Trump to Biden would be good for the economy, good for the stock market, and good for the reputation of the United States overseas. But like the rest of us, they didn't think polarization was going away anytime soon. Tonight, we have the opportunity to hear from a journalist who brings a unique insight into the connection between polarization and journalism. Amanda Ripley was an investigative reporter at Time Magazine for 10 years. She's a contributor to the Washington Post, Politico, and The Atlantic. And she's the author of several books. Her newest one is called High Conflict. And it explores why polarization has become so severe, how people communicate when they are polarized, and how communicators, whether they're journalists or PR people, can turn high conflict into good conflict. Amanda wasn't available to join us tonight, so I sat down with her a few days ago to hear her perspective on journalism and learn how it lines with public relations. And now we're gonna play a little bit of that interview for you tonight. Hi, my name is Amanda Ripley, and I'm the author of a book called High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. And the way that came to be is that I was covering all kinds of stories about human behavior and sometimes politics, sometimes other things. And I found that I got to a point around four years ago where it just seemed like journalism was often making things worse, uh, even unintentionally. And I wanted to see if there was another way to understand conflict and to be useful in a really polarized climate. When you look back at this history of high conflict, and I know your book has a very, some historical examples, but in, in recent history, when did you see this conflict escalate to the point where it is today? Was it when Trump was elected or, or before that? Yeah, I think it was before that. I mean, certainly in the data, the polarization really picked up in, starting in the 80s. And it was around the same time that trust in a lot of institutions was started falling as well, um, or flatlining in other cases. So. I think that was also when, you know, talk radio, Fox News, other things really realized that there was there were a lot of Americans who weren't being well served by mainstream media outlets like Time Magazine and CNN, places I worked for. And they just their values and their concerns weren't reflected. So there was an opening there um, and there was an opening to do some good journalism. Right. That was like really important and meaningful to many millions of Americans. And some of that happened on Fox. but. Also, what happened is that they realized you could really appeal to a niche audience through fear and anger based coverage grievances that um, that would give you a huge competitive advantage in in a crowded marketplace. And then other places have realized that as well. And, and so 
I, I kind of trace it back a little further. One of the things that you do now in your career and in your book is you advise journalists on how to tell stories or write stories or conduct interviews in a way that won't contribute to polarization. And it's a complicated topic, but I, I wondered if you could sort of summarize for us your, your, your learnings or your teachings on that topic. Yeah, I mean, when I went off to try to figure this out, one of the things I learned is that, um, you know, <laughs> the brain behaves differently in high conflict. So doing traditional storytelling doesn't work when you're talking about a very controversial issue. So the kind of catchphrase I ended up using was to complicate the narrative, right? We know that complexity, if it's accurate, can revive curiosity even when people are divided on the topic. So the question becomes, what is the narrative? And that depends on the audience, right? And the subject but you got to figure out what is the narrative you're, you're trying to complicate. And it has to be true. You know, like if there's a narrative that, um, you know, if you're, if you're talking about uh, vaccines, right. And the narrative that is on the uh, many people's minds on the left, I think it's fair to say is that people who are resisting the vaccine don't believe in science and are like, you know, ignorant Trump supporters. Um, so then the first step is to ask, first of all, listen to the people on the left. Is that actually the narrative? Then the next step is to investigate that. Like, is that actually true? You know, with like truly true curiosity, is that actually true? What is the, what does the polling say? What does the research say? Go out and talk to people, go do the reporting and really listen, right? Like really listen and see. In fact, usually it's like not one thing, right? It's usually like 17 different things <laughs> that people are having in their heads. And they're not anti-vaxxers or pro-vaxxers. They're somewhere in the middle. Most of us are. So uh, there, was, there was a nice piece in the Washington Post earlier this week by, or last week maybe, by Dan Diamond about um, Frank Luntz had done a focus group on anti people who were resisting the vaccine on the right. And he went in thinking that if he could just get Trump and people they trusted from politics to do a public service announcement in favor of the vaccine, that would be like the golden ticket. And what people told him was they didn't want any politician to tell them <laughs> what to do with a vaccine. You know, they wanted to understand the science better. They want, they were very in, interested in the number of people who had done the clinical trials because it's such a large number. And, and this is my favorite part, they said they wanted officials, politicians, and scientists to acknowledge that there are some things they don't know. It's not zero risk, right? Almost nothing is zero risk. And just acknowledge it. And that's just, what that is, is showing that you've heard them, right? That you've heard someone and you're not just shutting them down and treating them like idiots. So um, to me, that was a valuable story that complicated my own narrative about what, it, what is really going on um, without collapsing into simplicity. It's interesting, in our survey, we asked journalists, PR people, and then just average citizens, whether they thought that uh, given that we have a new administration, whether polarization will stay the same, decrease or increase. Most of them thought it would stay the same or increase. And I wonder what your feeling was about that. Yeah, I saw that. Maybe a little sad because it's a little bit, um, but I don't think they're wrong, right? I mean, but it, you would hope that we would think, oh, eventually Americans are usually pretty optimistic to a fault, maybe. And so you would hope that they would have maybe thought, oh, things will get better, you know, after the pandemic ends. And uh, But uh, I think that's probably right. I think that unfortunately, at this level of conflict, it the conflict itself is kind of in control <laughs> in a way. So it's very hard to disrupt it by doing the same things. Um, usually in this level of conflict, which I call high conflict, everything you do to make the conflict go away makes it worse. So it's a little bit of a negative feedback loop. It can be interrupted, but you have to do things differently. So yeah, so I guess I was interested to see that. And uh, um, I think it's probably right, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. It could change. Given that negative feedback loop and your your history in journalism, 
How do you think media has contributed this current level of conflict that we're experiencing? Well, it's sort of like you have to break it down by, I mean, we could spend all day, right, breaking it down too far. But I mean, there are different kinds of media, different times at which the media contribute in different ways, right? But so I don't want to get too lost in that. But I just want to note that it's hard to generalize, as you know, about about radically different kinds of news media from local TV news to NPR to Fox to Breitbart to Vox. I mean, there's just so much out there, so much noise, right? Um, but I do think that um, a couple of things have happened. One is that the business models of print media in particular, but other formats as well, became so compressed and pressurized that, you know, just getting people's attention is obviously the most successful model at this point. And that's the same model as Facebook and Twitter, right? Those are attention economies. And when you have that kind of model, it's easy to resort to the sort of lowest common denominator. And so for the news media, often that is fear, anger, those kinds of negative stories that drive a lot of attention but don't necessarily take a lot of work, right? So we saw this, this is how Trump was, was just masterful, right, at, at uh, using the media because every day you just say something and then there'd be 2,000 stories. And so um, that is a very easy story to do, but not one that necessarily illuminates anything um, and definitely fuels the cycle of conflict. And now at this stage, we're at a point where the conflict is so magnetic that it's very hard for anyone to resist, right? So increasingly, I think many journalists are part of the conflict because they are human, right? So they too are incredibly frustrated or frightened or stressed out about the political problems they see. And it's impossible to separate that from the work that you do. I don't think, I mean, I think there are lots of good journalists doing good work with integrity, but I think it's getting harder and harder to see the whole picture. And that's how high conflict works, it narrows your vision. In your book, you have some interesting terminology that I had never heard before. It's fascinating. And one was uh, conflict entrepreneurs. And can you tell us what a conflict entrepreneur is? And then are there conflict entrepreneurs in the media? Yeah, so a conflict entrepreneur is just a person or a platform or a company that intentionally tweaks or exploits conflict for their own ends. So it might be for profit, but often it's for something more subtle. It's for a sense of purpose, uh, meaning, camaraderie, power. All of those things incentivize conflict entrepreneurs. And we have designed a lot of institutions to really reward conflict conflict entrepreneurship, right? Like social media, but also politics and other things. Um, you know, going back to some of the uh, point counterpoint crossfire talk shows that we've had. So, so right now there is a big market for conflict entrepreneurs. And I don't think it will always be that way, but that's, that's where we are right now. And, and certainly, yes, you know, people in the news media and various companies have have acted as conflict entrepreneurs, sometimes on purpose and, and sometimes by accident. Twitter is a great example. Um, how do you think, we talked about media, how has social media contributed to this, the level of conflict and polarization we're currently experiencing? Well, social media is interesting, right? Because it's kind of like a microcosm of the problem. Like if you look at who's on Twitter, it's about 20% of the country. And then if you look at who posts on a regular basis, it's really the extremists and the journalists, <laughs> and the PR people, <laughs> and that's it. So it's a totally warped, you know, feedback mechanism that journalists rely on a lot. I don't know if PR people do, I suspect they do, but it really changes your perception of the world. And I always wished that, I mean, there are ways to design it differently, right? So even if, even if that's still going to be the incentive, you could design it so that you could get a sense of like, how many people does this tweet really represent, you know, in the world? Do I really have to lose sleep over this? Or, you know, even, you know, one of the things journalists I know fear most is like a tweet storm, right? Like just getting attacked and they might get 500 tweets. Okay. Is that a meaningful number? <laughs> 
you know, if these are 500 extremists who are, you know, activists, that's important to know. I'm not saying it's not worthy, but if there are 5,000 other people who feel very differently, that's important to know too, right? And it just doesn't surface typically on on Twitter. And the same was true years ago with the comment section, right? Um, so it is a really interesting way in which we've we've designed our world to make our, ourselves miserable <laughs> in some ways, you know, because you remember those really negative tweets. That's the most established human phenomenon there is, is the negativity bias. It's like, we, we can't help it. We're hardwired to really feel those attacks and they may not be meaningful. Some of them are from bots. One of the things you talk about is the use of facts and how as a journalist, you spent your whole life, your whole career thinking that if you present the facts in a fair and unbiased way, then people will understand and change their minds and believe what you're saying. But it, it, does that work in this context? No, it's, it's, I don't know if it's ever worked. It has taken me a long time and I'm still working to like loosen my grip on the facts as like the most powerful <laughs> currency and because that's like my whole identity was around that right if i can just get the facts and get them right and try to be fair um that's like my re i thought it was like my whole <laughs> if there was any reason for my existence it was that so it's very hard to accept that that's just not how humans work especially in conflict right it's not how i work so accepting that and realizing that trust precedes facts facts matter it's not that they don't matter but they're not the only thing that matter and they're not the first thing that matters. How do you think your, this conflict resolution and this idea of approaching, making a story more complex, how, how do you see that impacting PR people who are often representing businesses or uh, organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple tricks that I teach journalists that maybe will be helpful. I don't know, you can tell me, but, um, because this idea of complicating the narrative is really interesting, but there's a lot to it and it can get kind of uh, abstract. So let's start with something that's a little bit more <laughs> tangible and doable. Um, so we know when people are really dug in on something, they tend to be more open to facts they don't want to hear if they're shown to them visually. So like literally a graphic or a chart, right? A data visualization, as opposed to someone telling you something. Uh -huh. seems to overcome confirmation bias a little better. So that's the kind of thing where if I'm trying to convey something, I want to invest some money in a data visualization that I can then put out on social or on TV or whatever every time this topic comes up that will help people absorb what I'm trying to tell them. And I think nobody knows why Brendan Nyhan at Dartmouth is the one who did the research on this. And it's really interesting. Uh, and it's hard to know why it is that people will accept information in a chart and not, and not when it's told to them. But I think it's because it feels like you're coming to the conclusion, you know, not someone telling you. And that we know from storytelling, that's the best, right? When you're in a movie and it's like a mystery and you figure it out like one second before they tell you, that's way more satisfying than just being told. And we, you know, there was a quote somewhere, I forget who said it, but the, the person who is most trusted in conflict is yourself, <laughs> right? So if you read a, 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 you know, bar graph showing, you know, the number of people who have died from covid and you read it it's like more persuasive than if somebody tells you the number of people who died humans are capable of good conflict it's actually one of our greatest strengths and we have done it many many times right it's the only way we end up collaborating on anything to to build anything um to do any big project so um so part of this is is kind of creating the vocabulary around it and the traditions that help make it easier. And what's the, what is the first step in, in sort of that, down that path? Is it just recognizing that, that there is a different way? Yeah. I mean, I think knowing, okay, there's high conflict. It's very magnetic. It's hard to resist. There are certain like red flags that high conflict may be coming and you want to avoid those red flags. So one of them is humiliation. Humiliation reliably <laughs> increases your odds 
of high conflict. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that, but the bottom line is don't humiliate your opponent. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. You're handing them a weapon, which will be used against you. <laughs> so it's not worth it. And then the other, there are other examples of things that reliably lead to high conflict, but one is that there are two binary groups or choices, like yes, no, good, bad, Democrat, Republican. Don't don't have two groups, okay? <laughs> Whatever you do. If you want to like figure out whether your church should do interfaith marriage, don't put it up for a yes, no vote. Don't do that. But that's just feeds into our worst conflict instincts for lots of reasons. But there's so there are certain things you want to just kind of keep an eye out for and avoid. And then there are certain things that we know can help cultivate good conflict, right? Um, so, so sort of knowing that there are these two kinds of conflict. The conflict itself is not the enemy, but but high conflict is, right? And then it's like, how do we create good conflict? And and one way to do that is through complexity, to revive curiosity, to ask different questions and ask them often, to really try to get very different approach to listening. Um, and make it systematic across an organization. So there's lots there, but like there are things that you can do that make good conflict more likely. Can you get to a point where you can disagree with somebody but still maintain a relationship with them? Why why does that have to be part of that? Right, right. In high conflict, it's very hard to do that. But I have now seen enough people make that shift from Mm -hmm. high conflict to good conflict that I'm 100% convinced that it can be done. And it is actually a much better feeling. Like witnessing and experiencing good conflict is like, it's like you're like, you are the person you want to be. It's a much better feeling than being in high conflict um, because you're able to do two things at once. Like it's like a juggling act. Like you're able to stand your ground, express your points of view, say hard things, and still be curious about the other person and still retain some baseline level of dignity um, and decency. It's it's the analogy would be like, you know, um, if you, you know, there's a William Urey is a negotiator who's worked all over the world. And, and uh, he has this quote where he says, you know, you can't win the marriage, right? Like if you're in a, a fight with your partner there are certain lines you don't want to cross if you want to stay married, right? If you want to stay in good conflict because you have kids together, right? Like you can't annihilate this person, right? And the same is true in politics. Like there's a way to do this that is healthy. And there's been a bunch of research on couples that do this, by the way, where conflict for them still happens, but it doesn't degrade the relationship. Um, So that's, I think, proof that it can be done. I've seen it done. And we have to sort of work on creating more institutions and norms to help make it easier. When you think about the future, which emoji do you think describes the way that you feel (laughs) about where things are headed? Definitely this one, the prayer. (laughs) Definitely the prayer (laughs) emoji. (laughs) So you're praying that, that polarization and conflict will be reduced. Yeah, I mean, my biggest fear for a year, at least maybe more, has been um, once you have political violence, it's yeah. very hard to unwind because then there's revenge and then there's like, it just goes on and on and on. It's just like gang violence. There's no difference. And so, you know, we we have had political violence. You usually see it increase before and after an election. We have had that. Um, obviously, January 6th was an example. My fear is that it, we're not done. Um, but you know, I hope I'm wrong about that. Certainly Biden has turned down the volume on some of the most inflammatory rhetoric and that rhetoric really matters. Um, So what I hope for when I do the prayer emoji in my head is like, I hope for most Americans to speak up. Like, you know, the exhausted majority of Americans who are tired of the sort of extremism in the media, of the, you know, fear mongering that they see, of the nasty rhetoric on social media, it is time for the rest of us to speak up because normally what happens is we flee the scene and the extremists take over, right? And unfortunately, they're under the thrall of high conflict right now. And it's very hard for them to see what's happening. But in high conflict, I promise you this, I've seen it in every case I've studied. 
you eventually mimic the behavior of your adversary. You eventually do the very thing that you are most afraid of happening and the reason you entered the conflict. So it is, it is, a, it is a diabolical uh, game to play. And so it's up to the rest of us, the people just outside of some of that heat, to help everyone else out and to speak up and to try to call for decency and for, for peace. And we know that that actually matters. Like in research, if you call on Twitter for no violence and under any circumstances, people actually hear that. People in your network hear that. And so it matters. I hope you enjoyed listening to Amanda as much as I did. Uh, my favorite line is, we've designed our world to make ourselves miserable. I'm going to remember that forever. Uh, she gave us some tips or gives journalists some tips about um, what to do to reduce conflict and reduce polarization. We do the same thing in our um, report. And I'm going to share a couple of those with you right now if we can see them on the screen. Thanks, Jim. Uh, the first is choose language that includes everybody. In this age of micro-targeting, we're always looking for a single little group. Try to find language that means something to everybody. And you can do that by having more diverse voices in the room when you're thinking of new campaigns. Communicate with purpose. As Robert said, there's a role for companies to play and businesses to play, and not just tackling the issues they're comfortable with, but ones that are very polarizing, but where they can really make a difference. And as Amanda said, listen carefully and speak respectively to people who disagree with you. It's more important to have a relationship with them than it is to win an argument. And you also have to, as she mentioned, be careful with the facts. We have to exercise a healthy skepticism about the information that we receive and the information that we're sending out. And remember that facts aren't the only thing that a story can be much more powerful when it is about the people that, it's, that mean something. And finally, we have to collaborate with one another. It's the only way we're gonna build any consensus is by working with people that we may not like or normally work with, but that's what the future is all about. And to accomplish these things, communicators are gonna need to navigate a very complex polarized world. And to help them do that, at USC, we're developing a new tool in conjunction with Golan and Zignal Labs to help track the level of national divisiveness in a scientific matter and map it across all these different controversial issues that we're facing as a country. We call this the Polarization Index. And, uh, and I have two members of the two groups we're working with to tell us about that. Kate Rassi from uh, Zignal Labs is here and she's been working for months on this uh, project. And Johnny Bentwood, who's the head of global data and analytics at Golan, who's brought a lot of the thinking to the table. And I'm gonna ask them a couple of questions about the polarization index to give you an idea of what's in store. So if they can join me, that would be great. Hi, Kate. Hi, Fred. I saw Johnny earlier pop up. I know he's here somewhere. Johnny, there he is. Johnny, what time is it where you are, Johnny? It's 20 past two, so good morning to everybody. Good morning, Johnny. Um, let's just start real simple. Uh, Johnny, what is what does the polarization index do? Well, I think the best thing to think about is that in this world where we're supported by algorithms, unprecedented division, and the search for being belonging amongst like-minded groups, it's created a polarized society where people are misinformed about where they're placed to trust and dismiss outside voices. And so we need a way to understand that divergence and understanding which issues are most polarizing. And this polarization index is the perfect way to do that. And Kate, can you tell us a little bit about the methodology that we're using to uh, determine those outcomes? 
Yeah. So if we can actually pull up the slides, I will kind of walk through how we built the score um, and kind of what those scores mean. Um, so at a first glance, so based on some of the topics that were the most polarizing issues within USC's study is kind of what guided us to choose topics uh, for the polarization index. Um, if you go to the next slide, the first step in building the methodology is classifying where our media domains fall on the political bias and reliability spectrum. And I'm sure many of you might have seen some kind of media bias chart in your work before. Um, but for this, we licensed this specific chart and data from Adfontes Media, which is a public benefit corporation. And they assign each domain a score of uh, political bias and reliability by rating at least seven different articles from each source. Um, and those are rated by three different analysts with different political leanings to minimize the impact of any one person's bias on the entire score. Um, so we use their definitions to categorize media sources into seven categories. So along the y-axis, the scale goes from fact reporting at the top all the way down to contains inaccurate or fabricated information. And this breaks our score down into three categories low, medium, and highly reliable sources along both the left and right side of the political spectrum. And our seventh category is highly reliable unbiased sources, which acts as the neutral center in our polarization index. So within the Zimno platform, we built profiles that capture conversation around the topics that we wanted to explore first. And so the second step in the methodology is then looking within each topic and profile, exporting the sound of shares within each category of sources and examining the change in volume period over period. If you advance to the next slide, we're showing the stacked bar chart that represents the percentage of shares that each category of sources contributes to the total amount of shares across the media landscape. So for example, if you look at the red portion of this chart, the percentage of shares relative to the total market of low reliable right domains nearly tripled in Q1 compared to Q4 within the topic of immigration. And so the next step in the methodology is factoring in the premise that shares from low reliable sources are more polarizing than shares from highly reliable sources or with no bias at all. So we multiply the percentage of shares within each category by a score that reflects that spectrum of reliability. And we then take those weighted scores and sum up the percentages within the left and within the right side of the spectrum. And it's these left and right scores that directly ladder up into an overall polarization score for each topic. If you advance to the next slide, the polarization score itself is then calculated by measuring the distance between the left and right scores. So we can effectively say that this is how far apart engagement is within a specific topic. And so the polarization score is on a scale of zero to 100. One, zero being the most aligned the two sides could be, 100 being the most polarized. So of the three topics we've looked at so far, the issue of immigration has grown by 8.1 points this quarter, followed by 2.8 point growth in healthcare, and a slight decrease in polarization for the topic of climate change. And so the score itself provides a measure for the discrepancy in engagement between right and left-leaning domains, using the assumption that low reliable sources are more polarizing than shares from highly reliable sources. But this singular score doesn't directly inform us which side is driving the conversation. So we look at this score in conjunction with another that we created. If you advance to the next slide, from the same data flow that we took to create the polarization score, we also created an echo chamber bias score. And this measures the left or right leaning tone of a topic. So this score is on a spectrum of negative 100 all the way to positive 100. The closer that score is to negative 100, the more the tone is dominated by left leaning domains. The closer to positive 100, the more the tone is dominated by right leaning domains. And this score is taking into account the volume and proportion of right, left, and non-biased shares, as well as factors in source reliability within each category of sources. And as you can see in Q1, the immigration conversation grew 23 points towards the right side of the spectrum, which makes sense when we look at the growth in proportionate shares from low and mid-reliable right sources within the topic on that stocked bar chart I presented earlier. Healthcare grew 13.5 points to the left, and there was no change in the tone of climate change, which is to be expected since there was little change in the polarization score as well. And so 
both the polarization and echo chamber bias scores work together to provide a full picture of polarization within a specific topic. If you advance one more time, we built these profiles to capture all conversation around these topics. So not only do we have the polarization and echo chamber bias score, but we have the potential to explore subtopics within the conversation. So here we have a snapshot straight from the Zignal platform of our topic wheel that identifies subtopics within the immigration conversation this quarter as an example. And so we're very excited not only to release the scores of themselves, but also having the potential to explore um, opportunities within our own platform to investigate these topics even further. Kate, can you talk about the numbers in sort of the, as you're analyzing this, what, what's the scope of the universe that you're looking at? Yeah, so we're looking at all mentions across all of the platforms that Zignal tracks. So Zignal ingests data in real time. Um, it's analyzing, our platform analyzes billions of data points each month from sources like Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, news outlets, Sina Weibo, VK. Um, and then we're boiling it down within dashboards to look at conversation about these specific topics. And you talked about three topics tonight. How, are you gonna be adding other issues to the spectrum of things you're, you're analyzing? We are. So we chose five issues from the survey that we showed earlier um, based on what the audience determined to be the most relevant. And so the first five topics are going to be healthcare, immigration, climate change, COVID vaccines, and racial justice. And so there are many other topics that we will pull from that survey to look into like police reform, LGBTQ plus rights, legalization of marijuana. But we also have the ability to add in new relevant topics. So like the COVID vaccine or gun control when the debate spikes after current events, we have that ability to adjust um, to what's happening in our environment. Thank you, that is really a great preview. I, it's a little over my head, but I, I appreciate everything that you've done to make it uh, understandable. So Johnny, you've been working on this for a long time too. What is the utility for a communications professional to have this sort of information available to them? Well, just as you have the retail price index to understand how much a basket of groceries cost, this polarization index is a barometer on issues that are important to everyone. The further the divergence, the greater the need for adaptive messaging and empathy. It also means we need to come back to this time and time again. It's not a one-time thing, but a much-needed living and breathing study that will help us for years to come. But let's just focus on the implications for companies. Companies will need to filter all communication through a clear sense of their own purpose and values, and will need to be clear about the fact that some of those values may alienate parts of their customer base, even while they appeal to others. Secondly, Companies must adapt their messaging to different audiences, not based on demographic or location, but the echo chamber in which their audience participates. And finally, one thing we forecast is that as silence becomes tacit agreement, which is not acceptable, more and more businesses will be entering the conversations on these topics, and the polarization index will be a useful tool in helping them anticipate what reaction the media and public will have. Businesses, businesses are therefore going to engage more and more in controversial issues, and the polarization index will give them the roadmap to help navigate these topics. It will help them to anticipate pushback and what will resonate, what is controversial, and what will draw media attention. As more and more companies venture into this issue space, it will help them manage. Thanks, Johnny. And Kate, one last question. What, um, what's the timing for the, the launch of the Polarization Index? What do you think that will be? Yeah, so now that we've just wrapped up Q1, our team is working to pull the data from our Signal platform. We are creating the scores for all five of those topics um, that we plan to share in a broader report later in May. Later in May. So more to come. Thank you all very much. We look forward to sharing the, the polarization index with everybody in uh, just a few weeks. Thanks, Thank Katie. You. Thanks, Johnny. Um, that wraps up our program. I hope that you found it interesting and stimulating. Um, I really appreciate everybody that participated in this and especially Ron Antoinette and our team at the Center for Public Relations and all of the people at Annenberg that helped put, put all this together. 
Thank you very much for uh, all your support. Um, our report, which contains a lot of the information that you've seen tonight, it's a beautiful document. It's downloadable at our website, which we have shown a number of times. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can find it. And we have hard copies. If you'd like some for your classroom or for your colleagues, let us know and we'll send you some. There it is, annenberg.usc.edu slash GCR, Global Communications Report. Polarization is a uh, communication problem that impacts every issue our country is facing. It's driven by politics, it's fueled by media, and despite the calls for unity, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Uh, but change is possible. If we're willing to communicate with a message of inclusion, a spirit of collaboration, and a, and a sense of purpose. And I think that's what our job is as communicators. This is our time, this is, the, this is our job, and I think that we can all work together to make a real difference in this climate that I don't think anybody enjoys being part of. I would normally end this evening by saying fight on, but given the topic of this conversation, I don't think fighting is really what we're after. So instead, I'm gonna say goodnight and use the same symbol, which has a different meaning, and that's peace. Peace for everybody. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you all soon, hopefully back on campus live. Bye-bye.